Hello, here we're going to talk about the general features of animals and also the evolution of the animal body plan. Animals are very diverse in their anatomy, behavior, and ecology, so it is hard to classify them, but there are some traits to, that apply to all or at least most of animals. One that applies to all animals is heterotrophy. Animals all consume organic molecules that are produced by others. In this way, they are similar to the fungi. All animals are also multicellular. They are composed of more than one cell, and many of them have a wide array of complex bodies. Animals all lack cell walls. So they have a flexible cell membrane and an extracellular matrix of protein and cell connections that hold them together. Almost all animals show active movement. Many have very rapid, complex movement. Some are slow, but still mobile. A few show none at all. Animals show a wide array of diversity of forms. They can be small, large, while they do have many different body plans, the most common body plan is that of an invertebrate, animals that lack a backbone. Animals have a wide array of diversity of habitat as well. They can live in marine, freshwater, land, or terrestrial environments. The most common place to find an animal though is marine or ocean habitats. Most animals show sexual reproduction. Their reproductive cycle consists of a large immobile egg and a small motile sperm that swims to the egg to fertilize it. Most animals show a common pattern of embryonic development where a single fertilized egg or, blast or zygote will undergo cell division to form a ball of cells or blastula, which then forms a gastrula that has a pore called a blastopore in it. This then differentiates to an embryo. Many animals show a pattern from embryo to larva, an immature form that has a different habitat and diet when compared to the adult. The larva will undergo metamorphosis to turn into the adult form. Finally, most animals have tissues, collections of cells that look very similar and act very similar that all work together to perform a common task. This figure from your book shows some of these traits. Most animals are motile, like this butterfly here. Um, there are many forms of animals, but they're mostly invertebrates, like the centipede, but also like the butterfly. And then we have a development that begins with cell cleavage or cell division, like you see in the bottom picture. To classify different animals into phyla, we can take note of five key transitions that mark the evolution of animals. First is symmetry, which is defined along an imaginary line or plane drawn through the body. Second is tissues, specialized structure and function of cells, um, the presence or absence of tissues and how many tissue layers there are can help to classify animals. Third, presence, absence, development of the body cavity. Four, patterns of embryological development. And five, segmentation, repeated body units that can then be modified and specialized to perform certain tasks. So first is symmetry. There are two main types of symmetry, but even before this evolved, the most primitive animals are asymmetric. They have no symmetry. Animals from phylum periphera, the sponges, are asymmetric. They have irregular bodies. All the other animals are either radially symmetric or bilaterally symmetric. Radial symmetry is characterized by body parts that are arranged around a central axis. These animals can be bisected into two equal halves along any two-dimensional plane. 
So this is like a pie. There's infinite ways to slice a pie and you'll still end up with two mirror images, two equal halves. This is characteristic of animals called cnidarians, sea anemones, jellyfish. All other animals are bilaterally symmetrical. The body has right and left halves that are mirror images. These are divided along a sagittal plane that bisects the animal equally. The advantages of bilateral symmetry. The first is cephalization, the evolution of a definite brain area at the front end plus sensory structures like eyes, ears. This leads to greater mobility. Movement can occur in a constant direction, in the direction of the head. This is in contrast to jellyfish, radially symmetric organisms that just drift. So let's take a look here at the jellyfish. To the aquarium before you might have seen jellyfish swimming or floating rather in a tank while they are capable of movement they don't have a definite direction they're moving towards so it's a less purpose purposeful movement than what you see in bilaterally symmetrical organisms So with cephalization, you get greater mobility, you get greater sophistication of mobility, and that leads to more complex relationships between animals like predator-prey relationships, active resource seeking. Now a note here is that some animals have secondarily lost their bilateral symmetry as adults. So larvae might have it, but then as they metamorphosize into adults, no more bilateral symmetry. A good example of this is the echinoderms, animals like sea stars, which have a superficially radial symmetry when you see them as adults. Next, we can look at the evolution of tissues and a body cavity. Parazoans are the sponges. These are the simplest animals and they lack symmetry, like we learned about in the last slide. They also lack defined tissues and organs. Their cells can actually re-differentiate, which is pretty crazy. One cell can turn into another cell, so not much specialization at all. All other animals are defined as eumetazoans. They have tissues and produce germ layers that cannot re-differentiate. Eumetazoans have three possible layers of tissues, Outer ectoderm forms the outer lining of the body and the nervous system. The middle mesoderm is going to form all the connective tissue like blood and the skeleton, plus all the muscles of the visceral organs and skeletal muscle. The inner endoderm is going to form the inner lining of the digestive tract and intestines. Eumetazoans can additionally be either diploblastic or triploblastic. Diplo for two, these organisms have two germ layers, the endoderm and the ectoderm, and they typically do not have organs. Cnidarians are good examples of diploblastic animals. All bilaterally symmetrical animals have a endoderm, ectoderm, and mesoderm plus complex organs, and they are termed triploblastic. Once you start seeing tissues in animals, you can also start to see a body cavity. A body cavity becomes possible. This is a space surrounded by mesoderm tissue that is formed early on in embryological development 
and is distinct from the digestive cavity. Digestive cavity is open to the exterior environment. Body cavity is not and is filled with either liquid or gas. There are three basic kinds of body plans. Acelomates have no body cavity. Pseudocelomates have a body cavity that is housed between the mesoderm and the endoderm. Coelomates have a body cavity entirely enclosed within the mesoderm called the coelom. The body cavity is advantageous because it made the development of advanced organ systems possible. It accommodates and supports organs, it distributes materials all throughout the body, and it fosters interactions and development of organs. This figure shows these three different body plans. Top is acelomate. You can see that there is a digestive cavity, but the rest of the body is solid tissue. Pseudocelomate, there is a coelom, but it is not entirely enclosed in mesoderm. It lies in between the endoderm and the mesoderm. Finally, at the bottom, a coelomate organism has a coelom that is completely enclosed within mesoderm. We can also look towards patterns of development to define animals. The basic bilateral pattern of development consists of cell divisions that cause the egg to form a hollow ball of cells called the blastula. The blastula indents to form a two-layer thick ball with a blastopore that has an opening to the outside. We can look at development to divide bilateral animals into two categories. Protostomes literally means first mouth. Here that blastopore, that opening, develops into the mouth and then a anus forms from a secondary for a hole if it forms at all. Deuterostomes literally means second mouth. Here the anus develops first from the blastopore, and then the mouth develops from another secondary opening. When we divide animals up like this, we can see that there are some other characteristics that divide protostomes versus deuterostomes. Protostomes show what's called spiral cleavage, where cells divide um, spiral to the axis of the blastula, whereas deuterostomes show radial cleavage, where cells divide parallel to the central axis. Protosomes have determinate cells, meaning that the fate of each cell is decided early on in embryological development, whereas deuterostomes have indeterminate cells, where the fate is decided much later on. If you take one of these cells out of the blastula, it can form a brand new embryo. And then finally, the formation of the coelom is a little bit different. In protostomes, the cells part to form a coelom. In deuterostomes, out pockets along that gut are going to form the coelom. Finally, we can look at segmentation. Many animals are segmented, meaning that there is a series of linearly arranged compartments that are all identical to each other. There's two advantages of segmentation. Number one, redundant organ systems in adults. So if one is damaged or a few are damaged, that's not fatal. Each segment has a set of organs. Also, this allows for more efficient and flexible movement because each segment can contract and expand uh, independently and move against other segments. Segmentation seems to have evolved several times in the evolution of animals, in annelid worms, velvet worms like you see at the top here, water bears, mud dragons. We see it pop up over and over again because of its advantages.